Hello and welcome. In this video, we are going to talk about some of the features of blockchain technology and how they work and how they affect and are affected by privacy and security. So first, let's briefly describe blockchain technology and what it is and understand why hash rate is important to security. A blockchain is what it says on the tin, a chain of blocks. It's a database that stores encrypted blocks of data by chaining them together in chronological order. The blocks are grouped um, of transactions that have been validated by computing mathematical algorithms performed by the miners of the chain. So miners in proof of work or validators in proof of stake are the guardians that power the network. In each proof of work, and each miner provides hash rate to try to solve hashes and get a reward for confirming a block. The more hash rate on the network and the more the more decentralized it is, the more secure is the pool blockchain. So as an example with Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blockchain is well protected against manipulation due to its decentralized structure and proof of work. However, if miners manage to provide over 50% of the hash rate collectively, they can control the entire network and enforce their blocks. This would allow them as attackers to manipulate the blockchain. So hash rate distribution is something that's important to consider when we're talking about uh, blockchain technology. Since the risks of a 51% attack is high if the hash rate is low on a network, the transparency of the blockchain is an important factor in being able to see where hash rates are located and grouped together in pools. If one such entity has 51% of the hash rate, they could potentially take control over the network. An example of this would be our own platform, NiceHash where people can rent out massive amounts of hash power on demand and direct it to their mining pool. This can pose a security risk uh, if the buyers of the hash power are anonymous, since no one knows who is using the hash rate. If the buyer has proved their identity, it's much harder for them to use the hash power for nefarious purposes, since any law enforcement would know uh, who and where to find them, and everyone would know who had made an attack. So this is by no means a complete solution, and uh, NiceHash is an open marketplace, so we don't control the pricing nor the amounts of hash power which are available to purchase. And because of this open model, we have to be very cautious about our mining hash rates in order to not give potential to someone to do harm to a smaller blockchain. So NiceHash plays a key role behind the scenes, if you like, uh, in order to protect blockchains. Despite these challenges, Proof of Work provides strong security and Bitcoin is proof of this. It has the highest hash rate and remains the number one cryptocurrency. So proof of work also offers the possibility to add privacy and anonymity to the network. So proof of stake offers good security as well, but does not provide adequate privacy protection in most cases. So proof of stake systems are prone to what is known as the nothing at stake problem. So since mining multiple chains that not incur any cost, this is not the case with proof of work. Since mining twice as many chains, would use twice as much computing power. So a node could vote for multiple blockchains and prevent the achievement of distributed consensus. So in such case, double spending would be possible. So let's look closer at how security and privacy are affected. So let's first define privacy, security, anonymity, and pseudonymity, as these are quite distinct, but people often mix them up. And it's, <clears throat> it's important to understand the difference to see how these are relate to the different blockchain uh, technologies. So privacy is when you have identity, you know who the person is, but you do not know what they're doing. So for example, I know your name is Max, but I don't know your browser history or your bank account password. Those things are private. So privacy is nothing to do with hiding, as many people wrongly assume. It's uh, simply a factor of security. Yeah, and with pseudo-anonymity is when you have the attribution, you have an identity associated with the person, but not the actual person. An example of this is Satoshi Nakamoto, who created Bitcoin. We have a name and his actions are public and not private, but not the real identity. So this is similar to anonymity, since the real identity is not associated with the actions and is not the same as privacy, since the actions can be seen. So security is the process of keeping your assets safe, and this involves many moving parts. Security does not equal privacy. Bitcoin presents a good example of this, where the assets are visible to anyone on the network, therefore they are not private, but they are secured by the proof-of-work blockchain. It's important to distinguish security from privacy, especially when talking about blockchain technology. In some cases, not being private can be a security risk. 
If you can see a wallet with a large amount of money on it, there's a high incentive for criminals to track down and try to identify the owner. If you can see the password to someone else's bank account, for example, it's not private and therefore not secure. And anonymity is one people often feel most negative towards as it conjures up images of people in mass. So, but anonymity can be an important factor in providing security. Many parts of the world have strict totalitarian regimes where people are restricted or suppressed due to their beliefs or differences. So many, so being anonymous with only activity is a must for survival. If they could be identified, they may be persecuted or killed. So now we know the differences. Let's take a look at how this relates to blockchain technology and cryptocurrency. From a governance point of view, we need to be able to pay taxes or to receive salary or to send money to someone else, lend money or to transfer ownership. So regulation, when it comes to regulation, there are many different challenges for, for achieving this. Taxation is one. So with a coin like Bitcoin, it's actually relatively easy for a government to tax, although many may not have realized it. Even if you don't need to provide your identity to use a Bitcoin wallet, a Bitcoin wallet can still be linked to your identity, either from when you use a cryptocurrency exchange by doing a KYC procedure, or it can be found by force by using blockchain tracking tools. Uh, we see some very sophisticated tools which can trace back to an IP address. And of course, the amount on a wallet is always open and seen on the blockchain. Some countries are already taking steps to try to make sure wallets are tied to real identities for tax purposes. Uh, such as the European Union has some new rules coming into place to prevent uh, anonymous registration of new wallets uh, and El Salvador. So this is a good thing for regulation as it makes it possible to run an economy and governance. So we have security in this model, but no privacy in the Bitcoin style model. Yeah, and for ownership, now let's think about cases where you need an even more open model, where smart contracts are important for transferring ownership not possible to implement with anonymity. Person A needs to know who person B is. Say, if you are selling a house, for example, a contract cannot be made between anonymous parties since you would not know who had the ownership. Or a loan could not be taken out without knowing the identity of who has to pay it back. So many projects like Ethereum focus on use cases um, and build their networks on these purposes. The model compromises um, both security and privacy since everything is also public. We see Ethereum-based project being hacked for millions of dollars on almost a daily basis. So one of the biggest Ethereum hack was the DAO hack, which led to core developers to opt for a hard fork to invalidate the stolen Ether. So the hack was made possible by a program error in the smart contracts. However, since the community was not anonymous uh, about whether this was the case, some miners boycotted the hard fork. So this led to a fork because of which the old chain continues to operate as Ethereum Classic based on the stolen Ether until today. So, and in parallel, the new Ethereum chain developed into the second strongest cryptocurrency in terms of market capitalization after Bitcoin. So, and on Bitcoin, it's also made possible to show proof of ownership for as little as 0 0.0025 BTC via proofofexistence.com, for example. And um, if you combine blockchain with oracles, which are mainly used for logistics and insert real world data, which leads in the end to a fully transparent, more efficient and easier to manage supply chain. So at this point, an NFT could also help by linking ownership and responsibility for a specific product and time frame. Because from this point on, you now know what, where, when and who has the goods you bought in terms of supply chain and logistics. So then lastly, let's think about the opposite case where you need privacy, say to store your savings. Bitcoin is not really good for this purpose as the amount you hold is public. And as mentioned, there's many sophisticated tracking tools that can expose an identity. Not good if you want to store your fortune privately. Or if you live in a repressive regime, as we talked about, where anonymity becomes a lifesaver, then a coin like Oxenor Monero becomes attractive and even a necessity. These types of projects guarantee security, privacy, and anonymity, but they make regulation and governance virtually impossible. 
So how to achieve regulation? From these three examples, you can start to get a picture of the size of challenge governments and regulators have when it comes to cryptocurrency. So blockchain, as we know, is impossible to destroy without switching off an entire electricity of the planet or monitoring every single internet activity. So it's not going away. So how do governments regulate it? How do regulate something that won't go away? So one example would be China. So if you already control your internet like China does, is to not really try to regulate it, but to ban it. Uh, this doesn't stop it being used, as it's impossible to stop usage. But making it illegal does force it underground or overseas, as we've seen. China was able to do this because most of their internal internet traffic is unencrypted. It's HTTP only. And, but in reality, the ban is likely just for show in order to stop ordinary citizens from using it. It's their way of keeping control. Uh, many big mining farms remain operational in China. They still have 45% of the hash rate of Bitcoin. Uh, and this is likely because they're either owned by or collaborating with the, uh, the Communist Party there. So those who don't comply are forced to go abroad, sell up, move elsewhere. Now, uh, this is their way of re retaining control. It's a style of regulation, uh, their way of regulating. So on the other hand, we have examples like um, El Salvador. So they are using Bitcoin. They made it legal tender. Now, this is a bold move and a really great one for the future of blockchain technologies and a lot of optimism surrounding this. But at what cost for the citizens? The government can now see exactly how much money each citizen has simply by looking at the blockchain at any time. So all, this, all the citizens signed up for their national uh, wallet, the Chiva wallet, using their ID. So it's linked to their real identities. So you can say goodbye to privacy in this case, uh, and security can therefore become an issue. We have seen cases of identity theft and people trying to take advantage of this in El Salvador since they've implemented it. Um, if everyone can see that someone has two bitcoins on their wallet, how long before the criminals come knocking? These are black and white cases, but the rest of the world is still a bit stuck in the middle. So, for example, most European countries don't have clear guidance on laws on crypto yet. So, and the same for the United States and also countries that do have very mixed ideas on regulation. So, mainly because they do not grasp what blockchain really is and only look at the surface value of these coins. This is where combination chains become more interesting in the long term. Projects like Ergo, Dash, Ripple, or Hyperledger are examples of where you have the option to add privacy, but also the possibility to add features like smart contracts. These are likely to be the chains that will win the favor in the long term, provided they can get enough traction and strike balance with regulators. Smart contracts are necessary for regulation and can even be used to provide taxation on a blockchain programmed in by default. So when John goes to sell an Apple, the tax is automatically added to that transaction. Countries such as Denmark already have an economic model where taxation is quite open and automated, and it would be very easy to implement this onto a blockchain. So taxation has possibilities when it comes to regulation, and security can be achieved thanks to technology behind blockchain. But areas like privacy still leave a big challenge. And as general privacy, as we know, is being quickly eroded in our daily lives, blockchain can help retain some level of security over your personal finance. So lastly, we would like to thank the Ergo Foundation for inviting us to talk at this summit. Privacy and security are very important features to consider for blockchain technology and one of the main attractions of cryptocurrencies. We hope these factors continue be, to be considered uh, when new projects are being built or new features added to existing projects. Uh, for more information about the topics discussed in this video, please check out the links below. Thank you.